my grandpa, he was born in St. Louis. He was a jigger and a fiddler and and uh, and then he went to Battleford. Then he he went into the First World War. All right. Yeah. Was he the one who taught you how to play the fiddle? No. Uh, Dad used to play the fiddle a bit, and he tuned it up for me, and that got me started. And I used to go to the house dances and listen to these old Métis fiddle players. And I thought they were so great, you know, and I'd, I wouldn't leave them to watch them. And I'd go home and practice. Then I'd get mad because I said, how come? I said, that old fiddle player, he can't even write his name in his death. He can't tune his fiddle and then he can play like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the names of some of those old fiddle players? Oh, Delorms. Delorms? Yeah. Good fiddlers. Yeah. Lots of different songs? Oh, yeah. My, I never forget, I don't know if I was getting on my mother's nerve or what, but she says to me, if you want to be a good fiddle player, she says, you wait for a nice big moon night, night he says, and you go out and find a crossroad, and he says, at, the, at midnight, she says, you stand on that crossroad and play a tune. And he said, you'll become a fiddle player. Oh, I said. I kept that in mind. So this one harvest night was a big moon. So I went in in the barn and I got the horse, saddled it up. And about 12, 11.30 at night I went out, put my fiddle in a, in a pillowcase. I had no, no case. <laughs> got on the horseback and I went up about a quarter of a mile down the road. I tied the horse to the fence and, I wait, and then I got the fiddle and I went to stand right in the middle of that crossroad. And I waited till 12 o'clock and then I started playing the fiddle. Then I finished and I got on the horseback and come home. And I said, now I'll be a fiddle player. Eh? You I, didn't, I didn't tell anybody that. Oh, you didn't tell anyone well, that you did that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what happened, eh? Did it help? I don't know. <laughs> not much. Not much. Do you remember what tune you played? Well, you know, my first tune, um, uh, that's another story. I played Old Black Joe. I'm coming, you know that tune? De -de 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 -de. I was so proud of it, I said, Dad, listen. And I'm playing that, and after I finished playing, he says, what tune was that? To top it all off, I was playing these Maxi Cali Rose Goodbye, you know, and they were nice and slow. And my grandpa listens, he says, are you playing for a funeral? <laughs> His friend. <laughs> they had critics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you say that you learn mostly by yourself? Like... Listening? Yeah. Yeah. And then that. By myself. And that, and then that could My cousin been. played the guitar, and he knew chords and that, and, and my neighbor played the violin, and he had no 22 at that time, and I had no fiddle at the early, earlier part of my life there. So he lent me his fiddle, and I lent him my 22. Oh, I <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> But uh, after a while, we went to an auction sale and got a fiddle. But my first fiddle was, I was about seven years old. My brother got the wooden fiddle, and I got the little fiddle made of tin. Oh. I was mad. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So you first started out with a tin fiddle. Yeah, tin fiddle. Well, how old were you when you first started playing then, if you got your first fiddle? Well, like I that? had a little fiddle, but I was just fooling around with it, eh? Yeah. But I didn't really start playing until I was 14 years old, 15. I was, I got serious. I could go to bed and hear fiddle music. Fiddle music right through my ears. And then I'd get up and I, at night, and they thought I was crazy. I was trying to play. So, you know, that tune. 
just tunes that you heard yeah, or yeah. Two, tunes that you'd heard other fiddlers play? Other fiddlers play. Yeah. So how old were you when you went and stood on the crossroads? Oh, I was being about, oh, 13 years old, oh. maybe 12. Okay, just a yeah, kid? Yeah. And then you heard the fiddle music in your head after yeah, that. Yeah, I heard the fiddle music in my head. Wow. wow. <laughs> they say that's a devil instrument. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. Did I you know that the But fiddle, I did, I have heard stories, yeah. <laughs> did you know that the fiddle is a, is a woman? No, I didn't know you that. You didn't know. Well, well, that explains everything. Well, <laughs> you ever hear, you always hear an old fiddler say, she's a good sounding fiddle. <laughs> She's a good sounding fiddle, eh? She's got to be a woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did they have those parties where they used to take most of the furniture out of the house and just have chairs around the outside? I haven't been to one of those for years, but the last one I was at, like that well, was they, Port Capel. Yeah, they, they ended up, uh, the dance would start like a New Year's dance, and people would start coming, they'd play the music, and eventually you know one piece of furniture would move and and then finally they'd take down the chimney and move the stove out Holy. <laughs> <laughs> you too did they have parties like that at home I tell you, my grandma told me a story that's the truth every matey family took their turn turn on saturday nights to make a house dance and who made the dance had to supply the sandwiches and the coffee. And it was, at this place had their dance and they couldn't figure out, they were very, very poor. You know, and they said, how are you going to feed them people? Little players were, they'd go and play, but when the food started to come out, they had to have, feed the people. They had two coyote dogs. <laughs> now, that's the truth. Why they had two? One was a catcher and one was a killer. And the coyote. Oh, right, they were trained? They were trained. Oh, yeah, they're a good yeah. coyote dog. One would, he'd chase a coyote and knock him over and the other guy would come and grab him by the throat, hold him there. And, but he had two coyote dogs. And they had a big dance that night. And by golly, they had sandwiches. Everybody had sandwiches and everybody ate. Next day, there was no, no dogs to be seen. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> you do what truth. you have to do, eh? Hey, that's the truth. So, and what they said they'd done, too, is they'd, they'd put a coin, they'd make a cake, and they'd put a, a coin into the cake. And whoever ended up getting the piece with the coin is the one that had to have the following dance. Oh, is that how it worked? Yeah. Because I know when I was a kid, we used to have the coin in the cake. Yes. But it was good luck if you got it, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how they figured out who got the next dance for the next week? Exactly. Oh, that's neat. That's really neat. I guess, you know, when people used to all live together, in one community. Now everyone seems to be spread around and a lot of those traditions have stopped. And it was like people lived uh, together in communities and everybody looked after one another. Like when they'd go hunting, food was always shared. And so one person would get a moose and they'd share it with other people in the community. Uh, they help out the widows and the elderly and single, single parents. Actually, uh, in my days, I guess, uh, single parent families, there wasn't that many because most of them just lived along with their parents. All right. you know, so. And housing was not easy to come by. So large families lived in small houses and sort of shared the workload all the time. But I guess it's it's really neat when you think about how they looked after one another and how the communities cared for one another. 
And like when a child went out, if there was a, a person that they had to watch, like, okay, let's say somebody got labeled as a, a pedophile or something like that, uh, children were, like, the community looked after it. So what happened is if the children went out, it was all the people's responsibility to look after that child. So if they labeled somebody, it was okay. If he was, if a person was walking and was, you know, not regarded as a very respectful person, then just anybody would end up picking up the child and saying, okay, you come here and you wait, I'll take you home to your parents or, you know, just a lot of protection like that. Like today we sort of feel it's not our business and you can't interfere with somebody's life before it was everybody looked after everybody's children and everybody cared. And if you disciplined somebody's child, it was because you cared. You know, now you can't do that. What language did you speak when you were growing up? Actually, I, I spoke a mi mixture of French, Korean, English. So it was like mixture. Mm -hmm. When did you start speaking? Well, when did you start going to school? Did you, were you well, able to go to I school? Well, I knew how to speak English when I started school. But it was like, like uh, when you grew up, it was a mixture. My grandparents talked a lot of French. And because there was a lot of discrimination, they taught me how to talk French. And when I got to Green Lake, I mixed a lot of my French. And what I figured was Cree was actually French. Like when the teacher asked me, do you know how to talk French, Cree? I said, yes. And she said, say table. And I said, La table, la <laughs> plushy, you know. And here it was all French, and all the all the other students would just laugh, you know, when I was talking Korean. It was so mixed up with French that it was like they didn't think I could talk Cree, but what happened was all my verbs were in Cree, like oh, yes. pimpata, pimoti, you know, so. That's the way I grew up, with quite a mixture. Uh, what language did they speak in the home when you were growing up? They spoke French, mix of French, but when uh, uh, our Indian friends would come around, Grandma would speak Cree to them. And uh, she'd always speak Cree, they spoke Cree quite a bit there. And I learned from my grandma and them listening around there and uh, she used to, just one sort of lady used to come in, what, like she was saying, mm -hmm. whitewash in the house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She'd whitewash, and she was a pseudo lady. Yeah. And she'd sit down there, and Grandma would give her food and tobacco, and she'd eat, and then she'd take her pail, Grandma would fix it for her, she'd go out and whitewash. And I could hear her coming in, she's telling Grandma, Kawinge, go! Sempsi, in Soto. I said to Grandma, what's coming gay go? She said, that's empty. <laughs> Nothing left in the pan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she could get along in Soto, too? Yeah. Yeah. She'd, uh, then we'd have a lot of visitors come in there. Grandpa was in the First World War, and he had his steel helmet hanging on the, over the door. And this one matey guy coming here looking. He said, your husband was in the war? And, and, and you know, and Mitchell and my mother said, my grandmother said, yeah, she was in the first world war. He was in the front lines, which he was. Eh? He didn't want to be undone. He said, I was in the war too. I was right behind. <laughs> Grandma <laughs> said, that's no good being right behind. You gotta be in the front. <laughs> But talking about uh, hunting years ago, I remember my mother, dad coming back with some prairie chickens. 
and she'd pluck them and she'd, she'd uh, take the the crop there, all right. you know, and she'd cut that and she'd take all the grain out, just leave a little bit in there. She'd wash it good and she'd blow one end and tie it and put it in a warming oven and it would be big like this and hard and it'd be rattle for a rattle. I wonder if anyone knows how to do that anymore. Kids rattle. Yeah, baby rattle. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then when she was to boil the rabbit, she used to save the, keep the head and boil the head. And then we'd all eat dinner there, and then after dinner was over, she'd take the head, and she'd hold it over top, and, and she'd say something or whoever, who's going to do the dishes? And yeah. she'd drop that rabbit head, and if it pointed towards you, she said it in Cree, and <laughs> really, Hey, well, for a second, you know, I can't just remember how she was saying it. Then she dropped that rabbit head and if it pointed your way. You ever hear that? No, yeah. We eh? do that all the time. We <laughs> just, she, she'd take the rabbit head and she'd say, wapo wapo so now you got hot to skill. And she'd drop it. Oh, it's like the wapo yeah. of magic. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we'd play a game. She'd say, who's the biggest liar on the table, you know? Yeah. Oh, we them at the neck, I got gas skid, and then she'd drop it, and whoever the rabbit pointed at it. But we'd, we'd end up eating the rabbit head really clean first, you know. And the way my grandmother used to do things, my grandmother did it, not so much my mom, but my grandmother, I used to stay with her quite a bit. And when Grandpa would come with ducks in the fall, she'd take all the, the gut and clean them right clean and scrape them and clean them and all them, and then she'd fry them. You ever hear that? She'd fry the, the, the gut, but they were all clean, eh? And they'd just turn out like pretzels. They were nice. From the ducks? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we do that with, yeah. the, uh, with the ducks and with yeah, even right. the fish, but we cook them right on top oh, of yeah, the stove. She used to cook, uh, my grandmother used to take a frozen fish, maybe two frozen fish, and froze salt and put it in the oven, put it in the oven. And then, of course, they'd, they'd cook there. And as soon as the water would come out of the top, they know they were cooked, she'd take them out. During the pan there, she'd just lift one, the whole thing would come. The whole skin scale would come in one solid piece. And she'd take a knife and the white meat would just fall right off the bone. Turn around, do the same thing and throw the rest out. And she'd put white sauce with it. And there you had your nice fish. Was good? Yeah. You got big and strong, look at Oh, yes, I can see <laughs> Hey. Yeah. You're saying your, your grandma was a fiddle player? My grandma was a fiddle player. Um, you knew George De La Ronde. Yeah, you knew him well. Yeah. He was Called a, him Kearney. You ever see his handwriting? Oh, that guy had nice handwriting. Yeah. Yeah. When I went to the Meadow Lake Stampede, I stayed with him. That was, I must have been about, oh, 16 years old. I, I went to the Meadow Lake Stampede and I went and stayed at his house. Mm -hmm. And like he was a good fiddle player. My grandma played the fiddle, but when she played the fiddle, she'd dance at the same time. It was really neat. She danced with us at the same time. Play and dance? Yeah. I always get a kick out of washing people's feet. Yeah. yeah. You know when you're at Batash, even if you look at the judges, all their feet are going? Yeah. Yeah. And the fiddle players, a lot of times their feet are going too. Oh, yeah. Were there any, um, like, what, did people always use this for, like, the, the, like, for their bows and all that? Was there ever anything, like, kind of handmade or what they did with to fix their fiddles Part, they used, used, used to make out of, out of horse tail. Horse tail? Yeah. Horsetail. yeah. You used to get a 
cut a, some tail off a horse and they'd put it on. It's quite a hard job to do. Now, some people are using nylon now, but I I don't use nylon. This is real horse hair. That's horse hair? Yeah. I remember them using yeah. horse hair. That's horse hair. You know, pulling you it together. You can't touch the hair on account of your grease. It's in the oh, right. It, uh, you can't put your fingers on here either. It just greases it and it slides. And this is what makes the scratch noise. Um, my hair is probably long enough to make. You can see. <laughs> I, I worked on the Mackenzie Highway. When they built the Mackenzie Highway from from uh, Peace River to Hay River. So my uncle was a, a cat skinner there on Hay River, and he he told me he says you go to to uh, Edmonton. He says I I put your name in there to come play to come work. And he says, uh, I'm sending you some money, he says. I was about 18 years old. I'm sending you some money, he says. You take the uh, uh, bus and come to Edmonton and go to Bonds Construction. And then he said, they got your name there. You come to work here. So my cousin and I went. And I didn't want to go without my fiddle. <laughs> so I thought, I can't carry my fiddle with me because they'll say, well, that guy is not coming here to work, eh? So my neighbor, he was in the Air Force years ago, uh, Second World War, and he, he says, I got a great big blue uh, bag like this, Air Force bag. He said, you can use it. You can have it, he said. So I put what little clothes I had in the bottom, and I put my fiddle case in, in there, my case, fiddle, and I wrapped all my clothes around, right up. Mm -hmm. I, I never had that much clothes, but I had a little bit. And then, now I had a kit bag. And they, well, they didn't know I had a fiddle in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, we went to Edmonton, took the train to Peace River, and got on a plane there with no road. So we flew to Hay River and worked there in a, and the construction to freeze up and then we came back and uh, when we were in uh, on that construction there the cook was a fiddle player a good fiddle mm -hmm. player and he played a fiddle for me there and uh, I played it in the in the bunkhouse there and oh I had a lot of fun yeah. I bet you were glad you brought it I was glad I brought it <coughs> yeah, it took the loneliness away. Did it? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Makes you feel good when you play? <laughs> when I went to Korea, we were in Busan. I had my fiddle. Well, your fiddle's been around, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I had my fiddle. It got hot, hot there. Oh, boy. And when I went to look at my fiddle, it was all flat. It all came apart. Oh. All in the glue. Moisture. All the problems. Oh. So you know what? I said, that the heck ain't going to bother with it. I threw it in the garbage. Eh? And I come back and I, I got, I bought another one. But uh, that's what happened to my fiddle. It just melted away. In the heat? In the heat. Yeah, it just come apart. How many fiddles do you have now? Four. Four? Yeah. What's the oldest one you've got? Oh, I've got a Stradivarius, but oh, uh. it's just a copy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can get it from 100 to $300, really. Yeah? You used to pay $9 for them at Eaton's. A $9 fiddle? Yeah. Yeah. This one your favorite? Yeah, this is a good one. This one was given to me by my friend. A good one. Is there any? Uh, I don't know. Were you? Are there any special ways that you treat your violin, or any way that you were taught to treat your your violin? Well, I just treat my violin like I treat my wife, with care. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Do you look after it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They used to say never hang a fiddle upside down in your house, eh? Oh. Is that Why? What you, or it, it would bring bad luck. Yeah. I never heard of that. Yeah. Not to hang mm. it upside down? Yeah. I guess it only stands to reason, eh? <laughs> Years yeah. ago, 75% of the native people had a fiddle hanging in the wall, whether they played it or not. You know that? Hanging on the wall. Really, just like yeah. that? Somebody comes to play it. Always ready? Yeah. Yeah, we always have yeah. a fiddle yeah. at home and, and guitar, and whether we play it or not. 